As an individual who is interested in the security industry, it is often known and taught that the responsibility of security is on all end users. Not only is security the responsibility of a cybersecurity student or professional like me who does that for a living, but it is also the responsibility of someone who resides in the human resources department or the sales department, for instance. Now, security can seem very complex, especially when we have mainstream media portraying uh, cybersecurity as someone who is either working with green lines of binary code or the stereotypical hacking scene where a hacker is wearing a hoodie with the dark background behind him. The idea to keep in mind when it comes to either implementing good security controls or having better security habits is simplicity. In today's video, I will be mentioning five different tips that you can utilize either as somebody who is interested within the security industry or for someone who just is an average tech user. Hello everyone, my name is Grant Collins. I'm a cybersecurity student majoring in cybersecurity. Implementing good security hygiene and habits is a good practice to get yourself into. As somebody who is interested in the security industry, it can often seem or appear to the average individual that security is too complex and that it's either an inconvenience or that it is too hard for the average tech user. With the five practices that I have come up, you can better prepare yourself for security prevention and also have overall better security habits. So let's go ahead and get into practice number one. Practice one is using a password manager. Within the last few years, password managers have become a popular recommendation for better security hygiene. Many security experts with in the industry have often recommended the use of password managers as a way to combat either password retention, password reuse, or weak passwords. Basically, a password manager is a system that retrieves, generates, and stores random passwords generated by this password manager. Every time you create a new account, you have to assign a user name and also a password. Instead of you having to create the password by yourself, the password manager does this for you. These passwords will be seemingly random with characters and digits, and you can manually configure the settings to allow how many characters or digits you want within your password. After this password is created, the username and the generated password are stored in what is called a password vault. This vault contains all of the random passwords stored and created by the password manager. After creating this account, let's say you come back and you want to log in. Instead of having to supply the username and password, the password manager does this through the autofill option. Having this autofill option means that you really never have to look at the password in clear text. In addition to generating random passwords, password managers often allow you to store critical or vital information, such as uh, pins, credit card numbers, CVVs, and social security numbers if you are in the United States, for example. Now, you may be thinking, a password manager, it sounds great, you know, you're generating new, ran new and random passwords for each and every account, but they're all stored in one system. If the system were to be breached, there's absolutely no possible way to prevent uh, further damage. Within the security industry, this is known as an SPOF, or a single point of failure. Now, I won't get into to SPOFs, but oftentimes security experts and, and the security industry tries to stay away from SPOFs. But if a password manager is technically an SPOF, then why would security experts and the overall industry recommend password managers? Here's why. A password manager grants you the opportunity to memorize one very strong master password. This master password allows you to log into your password manager and then all the other passwords are stored within the vault. Therefore, you'll never have to experience password fatigue again because these password managers do the creation process for you. Oftentimes when creating new accounts as general tech users, we have the same either usernames and then we usually either alter, slightly alter the passwords or we reuse the passwords. In addition, many people do not follow the password best security practices, meaning that they have weak passwords to start out with. These weak passwords can be breached and then you are in a very bad situation where you have weak passwords and you're reusing or slightly altering your passwords. As an average tech user, it's better to have one master password you know, which is very strong. 
and then have access to randomly generated passwords for all of the preceding accounts. Although password managers have come under scrutiny for their SPOF or single point of failures, most security experts recommend that the average tech user still implements and uses a password manager. These password managers will solve the problem of weak passwords and password reuse. As long as you stay with brand name password managers such as LastPass, Dashlane, one password, key pass, you should be completely fine. Just remember, create a very, very strong master password and you will be good to go with practice number one. Practice two is utilizing a VPN. A VPN is short for virtual private network. VPNs provide two key aspects, privacy and security. If you don't know what a VPN is, let me briefly explain. A VPN in simplistic terms is a tunnel communication between your local network and an exit node in a different location, allowing you to appear yet you are connecting from a different location thousands of miles away from where you actually are. This is the privacy aspect of a VPN or what a VPN provides. In addition to appearing to log into a different location, this data tunnel is encrypted, which provides the security aspect. Now, of course, there's a little bit more that goes into a VPN, but that's the bird's eye view of what a VPN does and provides. It is recommended when using any type of public Wi-Fi that you turn on a VPN option. This will allow you to have an encrypted communication between the public router and the service that you are communicating with or you're trying to reach. Without using a VPN on a public Wi-Fi network, you are susceptible to many types of network attacks. An example of a network attack could be sniffing data, meaning that an attacker could intercept in between you and the communication or the uh, service that you are communicating with, and he or she can see uh, what is going on in plain text in between. This is known as a man in the middle attack. Now, there are also many other use cases when it comes to utilizing a VPN, especially on an enterprise and corporate environments. But for the average tech user, it's important to implement a VPN when really working in public Wi-Fi networks. In addition, there's an added layer of privacy, making you appear that you are logging in from a different country when really you're not. So this is also an added bonus to uh, using a VPN. Now, there are tons of companies that provide VPNs, both free and paid. With this being said, I recommend that you always pay for your VPN because you never know what these free VPN service providers are offering or what they're doing behind the scenes. If you are considering a paid option, there is many different types of vendors that are out there that provide VPN options. A service like IFC VPN uh, offers basically very competitive rates. They're secure and safe and they have a no logging policy. But of course, there is so many other VPN providers uh, that also offer similar features for the same rates. If you have no idea what VPN provider to use, I recommend using IVC VPN as a means to start and to see or explore your other options. There is a link in the description below. Practice three is logging off your computer when you walk away. Now, this is seemingly very simple, but it is very effective at the same time. When you leave your computer with your personal account still logged on, anyone has access to your computer, computer files, and the data on that computer. Especially for individuals who work in corporate environments, it's really important that you log off your computer when leaving your desk. No matter how long you are planning to leave your desk, whether it's for two minutes or it's for an hour, it's always important to log off. If you're a student at a university who is working on a university computer and you have to get up and go to the restroom, for example, make sure that you log off your account because even in a university setting, you never know. Basically, it comes down to this simple practice. Whenever you plan to walk away from your machine, leaving it unattended, go ahead and log off because it's a good practice and why not implement that good habit? It takes less than two seconds. Practice four is using an ad blocker. I'm a content creator, meaning I oftentimes receive a small bit of revenue when I have advertisements either playing in front of my videos, throughout my videos, or if I have a website, uh, implementing ads on this website. Now this practice completely destroys my earning opportunity, but I still believe it is a good practice to implement for the average tech user. Of course, I turn off my ad blockers when it comes to YouTube and supporting other YouTube content creators. Whether you want to turn on an ad blocker to avoid those annoying pop-ups or ads that play during the middle of a YouTube video, or you just hate ads in general, implementing an ad blocker 
can provide a good security benefit. Ad blockers prevent you from accidentally or intentionally clicking potentially malicious advertisements. Some of these dodgy advertisements, which are often known as malvertisements, can be loaded with bloatware, adware, and spyware. All things that you really don't want on your computer. So do yourself a favor and go ahead and implement an ad blocker right now as a preventative control. You can simply go to your browser plugin store and just look up ad blocker. I recommend the ad blocker uBlock Origin. It is one of the most widely known ad blockers and one of the most reputable. And finally, for practice number five is backing up your data. One of the most popular and common practices given by security experts is to simply back up your data. If and when you do get hit by potentially malicious or devastating programs, which could either delete or encrypt all of your data, it's important to have a backup. And I really stress the words if and when. For me personally, I recommend using an external hard drive. I use the CK expansion one terabyte hard drive. Here I back up any personal files, uh, Word documents, school documents, or anything that I deem important. After I uh, create this backup, I go ahead and place this external hard drive in a secure location that I only know of, uh, which could be in a safe, but if you don't have a safe, maybe hidden in the drawers. I will also note that it is important to get in the habit of backing up your data every so often so that it doesn't become or get out of date. So those are my five recommended cybersecurity practices for the average tech user or somebody who is interested within the security industry. Implement all five today and you will be better off in regards to online and offline safety. What do you think about the practices that I mentioned today? Let me know in the comments below. If you are new to the channel, I would consider subscribing, especially for anyone who is interested with keeping themselves safe online or interested with getting started in a career in cybersecurity. That is it for today's video. 